You're tuning in to the Wild, Weird, and Sometimes Normal podcast. If you have a story or a guest recommendation that you think others need to hear, email me at wild, weird, and sometimes normal at gmail.com. Let's get this started. Alex and Brett, kick it! Wild. Wow. And sometimes normal. On this episode, I'm joined by the editor of the Bigfoot Times newsletter, Daniel Perez. Daniel has been enthralled with the possibility of this famous cryptid ever since he was a young boy and saw the movie Legend of Boggy Creek. Daniel has the largest print collection of Bigfoot articles and on his website has an ever-evolving list of all books Bigfoot-related. We discuss Daniel's Squatch and Outings, the Patterson-Gimlin film, what type of evidence will be required to silence doubters, and why Bigfoot is so elusive to film and video. Stay up to date on Daniel's newsletter by bookmarking his website, sign up for the Bigfoot Times, and let him know you heard him on Wild and Weird. Enjoy the show. Are you looking to buy a home in New Jersey? Escape the city and move to the suburbs? Finally purchase that vacation home on the lake or down the shore? Maybe you're one of the lucky ones who are retiring and moving out of state. If so, let me help you. Keller Williams and the Real Estate Professional Group have what you need to make your goals come true. Reach out and have a conversation with someone who will put you first. Contact Brian McCoach at 856-321-1212 or email brianmccoach at kw.com. Are you looking for CBD for your pet? My friends at Pure Pet Wellness have what you need. They use the highest quality ingredients. While other companies may use synthetic oils in their CBD, Pure Pet Wellness uses organic ingredients. Organically grown hemp, organic coconut oil, organic shea butter, organic beeswax, and that's just to name a few. A family-owned and operated company that also offers fast shipping. Go to purepetwellness.com for all your pet's CBD needs and use the discount code WILD and WEIRD at checkout. That's wild, A-N-D, weird. Treat your animal right. Go to purepetwellness.com. Welcome to another episode of Wild, Weird, and Sometimes Normal. I'm your host, Brian, and tonight my guest is Daniel Perez, and he is the editor of the Bigfoot Times. Welcome, Daniel. Good to be with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Can you tell me a little overview of the Bigfoot Times, how you got involved and, and what it is exactly? The Bigfoot Times is a physical newsletter that is printed and mailed out to a membership that's worldwide. It started in January of 1998, and at the time, the internet was up and running, but not big. People were still publishing and printing and mailing newsletters, such as Ray Crow, Don Keating, Connie Cameron, and probably some people on the East Coast as well that had to do with Bigfoot and UFOs and so forth. And so I thought, I would throw my hat into the ring and compete with these people. And so from 1998 to 2024, I'm the last man standing. So the Bigfoot Times newsletter has made it through 26 years, and the rest of them have folded and gone away. That's awesome. Congratulations. How big is your readership? I was just emailing a friend in Canada, and I said, we've never broken a thousand. We've got close. So Our numbers vary from month to month because people don't resubscribe, and then months later, they jump back in. So the numbers are constantly in flux because no membership starts at, say, January. I mean, we got members that their expiration date is in like June or July. So every month, it's different. So right now, we're currently running at about 875. So here is for your viewers, copy of the newsletter. Can you see that? I can see that. This is the latest edition that just went out this morning. So I just happen to have one on my desk, and that's what it's all about. It's a four-page physical newsletter that goes out to a readership every month, and it's very affordable. Okay. Well, while we're there, let's let's talk affordability. What is the going rate for the Bigfoot newsletter? For a member in the United States for the whole year, $22.75. That includes shipping? That includes shipping. Wow. That, hey, that's a deal and a half right there. Yeah. 
So you just simply go to BigfootTimes.net to get signed up and you could use your PayPal account. I love it. That's great. When did you get involved with Bigfoot? My interest in Bigfoot started about 1973 and I was about 10 years old at the time. And I went to go see a movie at the walk-in theater, The Legend of Boggy Creek. And I thought it was like a monster movie, like uh, Godzilla or King Kong, something like that. And it turned out to be like a pseudo documentary about what was happening to groups of people in the state of Arkansas near the Falk River. And I couldn't believe what they were presenting at the theater, like as if it were for real. And so that's what piqued my interest. Have you ever seen a Bigfoot or do you go on expeditions? I do go on expeditions, but I've never had a sighting once. But I've seen tracks on multiple occasions, and all the tracks I've seen are here in the state of California. I wish the conditions were better. Were, And I mean that in the sense the tracks that we saw in Hemet, California, myself and Doug Trapp, it had rained. And so the tracks were semi-washed away. Had it not rained, we would have had an opportunity to see some really good tracks. And Hemet is halfway in between San Diego and Los Angeles. The second opportunity happened in August of 86 in the Sequoias, the Menachi Meadows. And this was a group of bridge builders who were building a footbridge over the Kern River. And they had a sighting. And then I guess I arrived about two weeks later. And during the course of the interview with the people who had the sighting, they had mentioned that, oh, and it left tracks too. So I shut down the tape recorder and I said, oh, can we see those tracks right, right now? And we went to go see them. And to the best of my memory, they were a little over 13 inches long, but they were in sandy soil. And because they were in sandy soil, it did not leave details of the impression, only that you knew that something had walked there that was like a person walking, not like a dog or a deer or anything. And it was very convincing to me. And it, it sucked me more into the question of Bigfoot even more, because you're seeing what you would call physical evidence in the ground of the passing of one of these things. Do you think that there is a benefit exploring at night versus during the day? What do you think gives you the best opportunity to see Bigfoot? Oh, I think the best opportunity by far would be evening and nighttime, because it seems to be based on the data that you're witnessing or we're observing or we're trying to document a species that seems to favor nocturnal activity rather than diurnal activity, daytime activity, more nocturnal than daytime. And it just seems, although there are lots of reports in the daytime, it seems like they favor the nighttime when they're out doing their thing. And I mean, when I say that out doing their thing, that's mostly probably patrolling for food sources and mates, unless they've already got a family group. And I think that's I would say nighttime would be the ideal time to go out and look. And now that 2024 is uh, back, say, in 20, 2004, we really didn't have the night vision goggles by FLIR and all that type of gadgetry. We may have had it, but not as sophisticated as it is today. So I would say with the night vision equipment, I would say your best bet if you're gambling would be nighttime. Okay. So uh, I interviewed Eric Spinner before who subscribes to your newsletter and he does some tours out in my area, really good guy. And I was talking with, with my brother and shockingly, I never really knew he even had an interest in this. And he's like, uh, are we going to go squatching? Like, can we go out with your buddy that, that you just met? I was like, oh, hey, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. So I'm going to hit Eric up a little bit later in the spring or summer and, and see when his tours go out. But I went to see, you know, is it better if we kind of just hike it during the day and see what happens or you know, hang out there. I know his, his go at night and I think till, you know, pretty late at night, very early in the morning. Do you have any thoughts on, so, you know, Bigfoot, he's, you know, he's allergic to photography, you know, uh, trail cams happens to, uh, to avoid all these things. Amazingly drones, the best footage was 50 years ago. I, I mean, may not, you know, there's been footage since then, but the absolute, you know, pretty best footage about 50 years ago. 
how do you think he avoids all, all of the current technology that we have, that we can have game trails and we can see what's going through there? You know, people who are hunting for deer, they have their gadgets up and they can see when it's best for them to start hunting. How do you think he's avoided yeah. it for this long? Okay. I don't think that's happening. I don't think they're avoiding. You could go back, take a step back and look at the wolverine pop population, not just in the United States, but in all of North America. There might be, say, 3,000 wolverine at best in all of North America. So what are the chances of anyone seeing one? Very, very slim to none. Regardless of whether you have your trail cams out or your drones out, it's almost like saying like, okay, let's go play the Mega Millions lotto. And it's just like, you know, eventually someone's going to win, but it's only going to be maybe one person or maybe a small group of people. So you could think of that as your Bigfoot and then millions and millions of other people who tried to play, think of their dollars as drones and night vision equipment. Their dollars didn't do anything, not because they weren't good, but because the rarity of that winning number. So the rarity of Bigfoot as equated to, say, Wolverine, it's just like, they're just not in the area. They're not all over the place. And so say you go out to a certain area that you think is squatchy, you get your drone up, you've got night vision equipment. It's just like, it might be totally cold in that area. It might be a location that has no activity or they were there two days ago, but now they've moved 10 miles north or south and they're looking for other stuff and you're out of luck. And so I don't think they're really avoiding. I think it's a numbers game. I think the population of Bigfoot, let's just say in all of North America, let's just throw out a number, say, even if you had 100,000 of them in all of North America, from Alaska to Florida, from Newfoundland to Southern California, that's still not a big number. So the opportunity to actually see one with your drone or your cameras is probably still very remote. That's, that's a very good point. And also separately, what I, what I got out of that is you're saying that the mega millions that I bought for this Tuesday night for 1.1 billion is going to hit. That's what I took out of that. Brian's ticket is hitting. Yeah. Well, the, the truth of the matter is you're probably not going to win. So the dollars you invest, I'm probably not going to win. So the dollars we both invested, it's just like, those are our drones. Those are our night vision equipment. But because there's only one winning ticket, our equipment is not going to work. It's a numbers game. Do you have any hope that we're going to get real footage, real, true, good evidence that, that can silence all critics? I think so, but it's not going to silence all critics. But Because even if we have crystal clear images, even moving images of video as opposed to still images, I think the skeptic and the doubting community is going to weigh in and, it, and say that, with the software that's available today in digital animation and AI, chat GPT or whatever they call it, and all of these apps that you could have on a computer, they would say something like it was absolutely computer generated and not real and that we need a body. And so getting back to that, it's just like uh, you look at Roger Patterson's film from 67, it's remarkably clear but the fact that it's not actually the body of a Sasquatch, they could continue to say, like, that's just the man in a costume. And even if we get crystal clear images in 2024 or 2025, they're going to say, that's just computer generated. Where's the body? When I viewed that film, I always thought, you know, it was amazing. I saw it when I was a young kid. and like, oh, my God, you know, there's Bigfoot. And then just recently, they've started, I guess, rescanning it into 4K and, you know, and uh, upgrading the video quality of it. It is just amazing now seeing like the muscles flex as as the creature is walking and then like turning. You can see all these things that you couldn't see before. You know, really hard to say that that's not a, a true picture of a Bigfoot. You see, but that's true. I totally agree with you. But I think people are born a certain way in the sense that they have a discrimination towards something like this actually existing because in their brain cells, they say this can't be. Therefore, it is not. And therefore, what we see on that movie screen is not a Bigfoot, but a man in a costume. But you always want to give credit where credit was, is due. 
I believe M.K. Davis from Mississippi was the first person to stabilize the footage and slow it down. And so, and you could see quite a few versions of those on YouTube. And when you take the 67 footage and slow it down and stabilize it, you could really see what it's all about. And there's not one hint of bakery in there, but 100% hints that what you're seeing is what you get. That's a Bigfoot walking on a sandbar. There's no smoking gun ever has been produced that what you see in that film is fake. Everything is to the contrary. And I think also, too, since it's been over 50 years since that film was shot, that if it were a fabrication, it would have been taken apart by now. They would have said, okay, here's the secret sauce to this. Here's the confession. Here's the man. But no one has been able to produce the good good. Right. I think that that lends credit to that is an actual film, of, you know, capturing a supernatural creature or, uh, you know, not supernatural that it's magical, but just, you know, something that we don't see every day. So also with regard to the Patterson Gimlin film from October of 67, is that there's various aspects to it. Most people don't realize that, okay, so something walked on that sandbar. And so second, the second point of evidence is that there's physical evidence left by the way of footprints that were left in the sandbar that were not only photographed and filmed, but also plaster of Paris casting. So to my knowledge, I'm the only person in the world who's interviewed three people, Lyle Laverty, Richard Henry, and Jim McLaren. Of the three I've just mentioned, only Jim McLaren is still living. Richard Henry passed away a few years ago. I take that back. Two of them are still living. Lyle Laverty is still living. And so I interviewed these people on tape, and with Jim McLaren, I interviewed him on private message through Facebook for the book I'm working on. And each one of these people saw the footprint evidence in person. With Lyle Laverty, it was on Monday. The film was shot on Friday. So one, two, three days later, he saw the tracks with Jim McLaren. He was with Richard Henry, and they saw the tracks. November of 67, just over a couple of weeks, a, a week and a half or something after, they all mentioned to me that the tracks that were left in that sandbar were extremely deep, almost an inch deep, three quarters of an inch, and that their footprints, and I asked them, how much did you weigh at the time? And I think not one of them weighed 200 pounds. And believe it or not, at the time in question, Jim McLaren was about six feet four inches tall, and I don't even think he weighed 200 pounds. He was a bean pole, as they say, a very slender individual. And none of their tracks on the sandbar at the time were sinking anywhere close to what the subject left in terms of tracks. And so forget about the film for the moment. Explain to me how these tracks were made. Even if they were faked tracks, you know, they, you know, they have a cut out of a foot. How are you getting that much pressure if a 200 pound person can't even make it up? Where are they getting, you know, did everyone just stood on top of each other's shoulders and made a thousand pounds? Like that's going to have to be somebody's answer. Yeah. And, and so Richard Henry, who's passed away, he was a Willow Creek resident and he was the person that drove Jim McLaren up there on November 5th of 67. He explained that he got on his hands and knees to look at the tracks. And he says, I was trying to figure out how these things could have been faked. And he said, there was no, there was no indication of fakery that someone had brought some piece of equipment in here to do something like that. And he said, they, he says he's an, a hunter from the past. And he said, they just looked like natural tracks that were left in the sandbar, which is the same story that coincides with what Roger and Bob said when they filmed it. That this was something extraordinary and they got a film of it, walked away and went up the mountainside. I do agree that with skeptics, you know, if it wasn't learned in their natural history class or natural science class in their history class of, of things that have come before, it's hard to expand your mind to include like a new model. And now with technology, how easy it is to get faked. You can go on UFO Twitter or Reddit or whatever and just see the most amazing pictures that are not real. 
at all. The most amazing videos that somebody created that are not real at all. And it makes it very difficult for the real ones that do come out, you know, to have them stand against them. Because the fakes are just so much clearer and, and more entertaining and what Hollywood can do. Can you ever convince the skeptics? I don't know. But it is going to take, you know, the physical evidence of a, of a body of a Bigfoot, I think, to convince the, the vast majority who are still holding out. Yeah. I mean, I just happened to be watching on YouTube yesterday just to try to get into the mind of the skeptics and doubters about the issue of landing on the moon in Apollo in 69. And these people really believe that we never went to the moon. And I just said, well, let them do their thing. And I just wanted to try to understand more fully what their ideas were about that this was a well-kept secret. And say if NASA was involved in it, that would be thousands of people that are in on the secret. And to think that no one has spilled the beans today, that's just absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But getting back to the topic, it's one thing that has come to mind in our discussion is that if any person would have to accept only the animals that they've actually seen with their own eyeballs, most animals would not exist to them, such as a polar bear, a killer whale, a seal. The only thing that would probably exist is dogs and cats and a few birds. Squirrels and, and rabbits. Else, yeah. Yeah. And everything you don't see else very much. Is like it would not exist to them if they didn't see it with their own eyes. And so there, there itself is a point of discussion. It's just like, just because I haven't seen a Bigfoot, that doesn't mean I don't know. I don't think they're out there. I've spoken with tons of eyewitnesses who claim that they are out there and they've seen them themselves. And I completely believe them. I mean, these are these are people from all walks of life, just like you and I. I happen to be a union licensed electrician, and there's other people out there that work in the construction industry or doctors and lawyers who've had sightings of Bigfoot, and I have no reason to doubt their story. I do think with the recent admission or you know interest, the way the winds are blowing now, at least for UFOs, and in 2017, the New York Times and the federal government taking more interest and in, in doing hearings, that that is becoming more mainstream. And it's okay for you know a doctor or a lawyer, as we're talking about, to come out and say, I saw a UFO. You're no longer labeled a crackpot seeing that. I think the more that that dam breaks, you're going to see the dam break more for cryptids, for Bigfoot, for these elusive animals that could be, you know, hiding in the wilderness. Yeah, exactly. It's just like maybe 20 years ago, it may have been semi-taboo, but today it, it's very acceptable. And, and you know, we're just exploring our planet. We want to know what lives on the planet with us. And uh, so here in North America, we have other upright walking primates like us. They just happen to be a lot more exclusive and reclusive. I was listening to a podcast one time, and they were talking about the Tasmanian tiger in Australia, and that there's pretty good evidence that it's still around, that it was extinct, but then people captured on trail cams, and there's some photographs of it. And the person on the podcast was positing that the reason that the Australian government doesn't recognize that this extinct animal is back, because then it would have to be on the endangered list, and then every type of you know, new roads or construction fixing or anything that they're doing would have to be put on hold because it's this animal's natural habitat. Do you think any of that plays into Bigfoot? Like the logging industry in the Pacific Northwest would have to get put on pause if they find out that only 10 Bigfoot live in there. Uh, it might. I, I don't know what the government is thinking about the matter. I think they're just as uh, puzzled as we are because you got to remember that a lot of people in the government are they're not well read on this subject. They just read the, the the headlines and, you know, the Ray Wallace headlines that I was the guy that created Bigfoot. And now that he has been dead since 2002, they have no explanation how all the tracks and sightings have happened from 2002 to 2024. You know, it's just like, yeah, that's good up to 2002. But once you go past that point, it's this phenomenon is still happening. And no one has an explanation for it. So I don't know exactly what the government is thinking, but that may play into it. But if if someone does get a Bigfoot, I think I well, 
I don't know what would happen, but I think that logging would continue to go on because as as we can see, they seem to be doing pretty well with what we're doing to the planet. I mean, they they we've got reports from Florida, we've got reports up in Maine, Alaska, California. So we don't know what the numbers are, but I would suspect that they're probably still thriving in spite of our continuous push to uh, deforest the planet. How many different types of species do you think there are of this Bigfoot? You know, there's like the skunk ape in Florida. There's you know supposed to be a, a more red haired one, a darker haired one. You know, they have the abominable snowman that, you know, the, the Yeti, things like that. Do you think these are all the same creature, like a little bit of offshoots, like cousins? In North America, I can't speak for any other continent but North America, based on my expertise, but I would say maybe at best, maybe three, one species and two subspecies of, of the animal, like the mountain gorilla and the lowland gorilla. And it does seem that some of the reports, but not all of the reports coming out of Florida, have a distinctual difference in what the eyewitness is reporting, even though they have your typical Bigfoot type creature, eight foot tall, hairy, smelly, but they also have reports of smaller and different creatures that have been reported in terms of physical characteristics. So yeah, there might be some subspecies in Florida, and I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if in Canada, up as you start going north, that there might be another species that makes a seven foot tall Bigfoot look small by comparison. You know, I just a bigger species and and maybe that's another subspecies of what originally came over onto the North American continent. But again, they're still the same species but over time and turned them into a subspecies. So it's it's like one that turned morphed into a different variation of the same thing. What content are you putting in your newsletter? Where are you gathering this from? Everywhere and anywhere. Most people are not aware that I have the largest physical paper files in the world on the subject matter. So I have a four-bedroom house and three bedrooms are occupied by files on the subject matter. And I think I have the largest physical library on the subject as well. I do know that if you go to BigfootTimes.net, we have the largest compilation of books ever assembled in a section called Project Bigfoot Books. And so every single book that's ever been published on the subject matter is in that website, and you can see it for free. So whether the book was published in 1963 or 2024, we're trying to catalog and keep track of everything that's been published on the subject. So yeah, I get my information from all different sources. Do you find yourself as the go-to person that people are reporting sightings to? Do you, like they want to tell you the story? Yes. yes and no. Like I've told other people who've interviewed me, I try to kind of uh, fly below the radar screen because I still work full time. And so I don't want to have every minute of my time occupied by either my electrical activities or my activities bigfooting. I want to have what everyone likes free time just to do what I want. Maybe watch a football game. Or something like that. I love it. So you said earlier you're working on a book. Can you give any information about that? Uh, yeah, obviously a Bigfoot yeah, book. Yeah, it's it's what I've been working on for quite some time. It's a pictorial survey of the Patterson-Gimlin film, similar in nature to what I already published in a booklet called Bigfoot at Bluff Creek. And it looked like a black magazine, the original publication. And so this next one is going to be quite a bit thicker and profuse with color and black and white images. And like I wrote in the newsletter, this current edition right here, I'll read it to you about what I want, what this book is going to do. I'll put my readers on. And I wrote in my final sentence about what I'm working on. I said, my objective with this book is for your lower jaw to hit the floor. So that's what I'm working on. And so because we have a book section in the newsletter and I said, well, we need to address this because the readers are wondering, hey, what's going on with what you're doing? Do you have a time frame? I know you've been working on it for a long time. Do you have uh, at least a hopeful? I would love love to get it out this year. So what the text is ready. And so what I want to work on is the layout 
how this thing is physically going to look, the cover, the index, and then right after we get that and get with a proper printer to do the work. Because if it's not 100%, if it's not needle sharp, I don't want to put my name on it. I don't want to put it like the books that are coming out today. I'm not going to mention any of the books, but I'm so disappointed because they're just these mass $20 books that Amazon prints or whoever print on demand. And they're okay, but it's just like, it's not like back in the day when there were these hardback books that were of a higher quality all the way around. So I want to put the quality in there. As a reader, I appreciate that. As somebody who uses print on demand sometimes, uh, it, hey, it's easy to get uh, authorized to publish anything you want. And after the Maui fires, there was a book that came out, I think the next day, where was that? But somebody used chat GPT and just how many, you know, crappy books you can print without you even putting any effort into it. That, it, you know, that chat GPT can just write chat GPT, write me a book on the history of Bigfoot and all the major sightings. And please include a couple sources. And in no time, I'll have a 200 page, you know, not a very good book, but you put it out there and hopefully, hey, 20 people buy it at 20 bucks a piece and I'm getting ten dollars out of it but hey not a bad deal for no effort yeah i think maybe in the future maybe not to not too far in the future people are going to be going to mcdonald's and thinking they're having a five-star restaurant or as though it's a steakhouse you know because people don't know what high quality is compared to low quality until you have it yeah no no disrespect to mcdonald's but i'm just trying to make the point right if all you have you know, is, is the fast food, you can't appreciate a truly good steak. And if all you're doing is just reading some of these print on demands or some of the, the lazier writers, you can't appreciate somebody who put in that hard work and effort. And then also like fear of loss. Like, did I just waste all my time doing this? That I, you know, I, I can't have my name associated with this as you're going back through the fine tooth comb. And to you, it matters that every I is dotted, every T is crossed where someone else is like that, ah, put it out, whatever there's mistake, who cares? They'll figure it out later. Yeah. And I yeah. don't want to do that. No, yeah, as as a reader, a vast majority of topics. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I I'm swinging for the fences. You're going to get there. Yeah, you 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 have outlasted everybody else in a physical newsletter who started before you around the same time. I have no doubt you're going to get there. Daniel, I appreciate this. This is a a, a quick interview. We we had some East Coast West Coast fights. It was like the old school 90s rap battles here. Who would win? And we both compromised and we we agreed upon peace on the East Coast and West Coast. But can you tell people all right, let's just, and you've said a bunch of times, but just put it in one final place. Best place to find you, best place to sign up, and where can people follow you? This letter is called Bigfoot Times, and the only place to follow me is on bigfoottimes.net, and you can sign up for the newsletter. It's the best bang for your Bigfoot buck. I love it. Guaranteed, or, you know, you can just file a complaint. I don't offer money back for you. <laughs> Daniel, I sincerely appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You, you have the, the Chiefs hat on. I'm in the Philadelphia area, in the suburbs of Philadelphia. So as an Eagles fan, I'm I'm seeing her hat. It's a little painful. Seeing Jason Kelsey out there hanging out, celebrating, you know, Travis's success. I, I enjoyed him pounding beers with his shirt off. You know, I say good for him, you know, freezing out doing that. But uh you picked a good team there to support. All I can say is always bet on winners. Oh man. Back in a row. That, stabbing that uh, knife a little deeper in my heart. I appreciate it. <laughs> Daniel, you take care. Thank you so much for coming on. I truly appreciate this. Thank you for having me, and we'll get back to doing what we were doing before the interview. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. All right, everyone. That was our show. Don't forget to leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you stream your podcast. Like and follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date in all things wild and weird. Check out the links in the show notes for more information on our guests. The biggest support you can offer is to tell everyone about the podcast. Until next time.